PID Theory and Robotics, My Breakthrough Junior Challenge Submission. Robots. They are currently among the most new and exciting of industrial control systems. They are revolutionizing the entire world, from automating industry with cutting-edge production lines and collaborative robots, to inspiring the next generation of engineers, scientists, and mathematicians. Typically, to be of any use, robots and other industrial control systems have some kind of output that affects their system and the world around them. Now, how does the output device know what to output? Well, sometimes a robot may simply be receiving commands from a human operator. That's me, by the way. In this case, the human picks a target for their robot, then gets feedback from their senses, such as their sight, and adjusts the output of the robot accordingly to achieve the target. However, autonomous robots, or robots that operate without human control, are much cooler. Remember that human operator we just talked about? Robots and other industrial control systems operate in much the same way. They have a target, or set point. They take feedback from sensors to know how far away the system is from its target, and then adjust the output of the system to achieve the target. Before we get to the math behind this output, a very important concept to see here is error, which can be defined as the set point minus the value of the system. So basically the distance from the system's target to the actual value of the system. Now, based off of this error, the robot needs to calculate an output to correct this error. A widely used and very good way to do this is the PID theory of control. And this is what I'm going to explain to you in this video. Let's break down PID. The acronym stands for Proportional Integral Derivative. Each one of these terms describes a way that PID reacts to the amount of error in the system. If you haven't learned calculus, then the second two terms might not seem so intuitive. However, the proportional part should make sense. It means that part of the output is directly proportional to the current error. Before we really dive into what these parts of PID mean, we need to take a look at the equation that drives this theory. It can look a little scary at first, but don't worry, it will all make sense in a second. As you can see, there are three terms here. The proportional term, the integral term, and the derivative term. Each term has a k, which is a constant gain. Note the subscript. K is usually different for each term. K sub p, k sub i, and k sub d essentially determine how much influence the p, i, and d terms, respectively, each have on the output. Now, let's break this equation up into parts. First, let's take a look at the proportional term. It is quite simple. It is just the current error multiplied by the gain. This means that the output of the function is directly proportional to the error in the system. In other words, if the error goes up, the output goes up. If the error goes down, the output goes down. Clearly, the proportional term will get the system closer to the target. But if you think about that previous sentence some more, you might begin to see the problem with using just the proportional term. To better understand this, let's take a look at the graph of a P controller, that is, a control system using just the proportional part of PID theory. Here, the dotted red line is the set point, and the blue line is the value of the system. As you can see, in the beginning there is a large error, and so proportionally there is a large output. This large output causes the system to quickly jump up towards the set point and then overshoot it. Then this negative error causes it to rapidly decrease. The system then oscillates, and due to the fact that the p-term produces an output proportional to the error, the system will settle at some value below the set point. At first, this might seem counterintuitive. After all, the whole point of the control system is to reach the set point. But think about it. Remember how we said that because this function produces an output proportional to the error, if the error goes up, the output goes up, and if the error goes down, the output goes down? So then think about the situation around, say, this point. The output tries to make the system get closer to the set point, but then the error becomes smaller, and so the output becomes smaller, and ultimately the system just goes back to where it was. The system eventually settles down in this way. The error present once the system is more or less settled is called the steady state error. So how do we get rid of this steady state error? We add the integral term. For those of you unfamiliar with calculus, an integral gives the area under the curve of a function. This might be a little difficult to wrap your head around if you are just now being introduced to it, but what you need to know is that in PID theory, the integral term is essentially a buildup of the error in the system. Let's compare the graph of a PI controller, a control system using both the proportional and the integral parts of PID theory, with the earlier graph of a P controller. Looking at this new graph, we see the same initial ramp up that we saw earlier. 
However, the integral term causes the system to shoot up towards the set point more rapidly because it is accumulating the error from the past. And once again, we see a big overshoot. The proportional and integral terms then work together to bring the system back down below the set point, and the system oscillates once again. But this time, it's around the set point, and this is due to the integral component. Think about it. Because the integral term is an accumulation of the past error, on the initial jump up to the set point, the integral term is accumulating the positive error and giving a greater and greater contribution to the output. Then, when the system overshoots, the accumulation of this negative error cancels out some of the earlier accumulated positive error, decreasing the contribution of the integral term to the output. This happens over and over again until the system eventually settles on the set point. Notice how now there is no steady state error. Do you see why steady state error is impossible to have with an integral term? It's because over time, the error would accumulate and the integral would force the output up until the accumulated positive error would cancel out with the negative error. It's this repeated need to cancel out the accumulated error that makes the system oscillate around and eventually settle at the set point. Now our graph looks much better. The system actually reaches the set point, and it does so in a fairly timely and accurate manner. But if you see the overshoot that happens and think, that's a problem, in many cases you'd be right. To combat this, we can add in the final component of PID theory, the derivative. Again, this is a calculus concept, but so it's a little easier to grasp than integrals. The derivative is essentially the rate of change of a function. So, in the context of PID, the derivative is basically the rate at which the error is changing. So let's think about it. If the error is decreasing at a faster and faster rate, that is, the system is getting closer and closer to the set point, then the derivative term will become more and more negative, decreasing the output. To see this in action, let's add a graph of a PID controller, a control system using all three parts of PID theory, to our earlier comparison. As you can see, adding the derivative has really reeled in this system. Looking at the graph, we can see how the output decreases as we get closer to the set point. Thanks to this, there is much less overshoot. The system slows down as it approaches the set point, which can be very important in the practical application of PID theory in mechanical systems. There is essentially no oscillation, again a good thing in practical systems, and the overall time it takes the system to finally settle on the set point, or the settling time, has been greatly reduced. This is about it when it comes to PID theory, so let's quickly recap with this final graph. The proportional term of the equation is what makes the system initially start sharply moving towards the set point, and is mainly responsible for the overall fact that the output of the system responds proportionally to the error. The integral term makes the system approach the set point even more quickly and ensures that there is no steady state error. Finally, the derivative makes the system slow down as it approaches the set point, making the system achieve the set point in a more controlled fashion, with less overshoot, oscillation, and settling time. So by now you might be thinking, well, this is all well and good, but what do these graphs even represent? Let's turn to FIRST Robotics Competition Team 225 Techfires 2015 Robot Phoenix for a demonstration of PID at work in real life. Let's watch Phoenix try and maintain a single position amid disturbances which are provided by a person pushing on him. Did you see Phoenix move in a way similar to the graphs that we've been looking at? Let's take a look at the actual position versus time data recorded on the robot and break down this movement. Although in this case the system is starting already at the set point, the general shape of the graph should look quite familiar. We can see the robot resting at its starting position in the beginning, then it is pushed away from the set point by the person. The PID controller then takes over to return the robot to more or less its original position. There is some steady state error here because of physical constraints such as the robot's inertia. Then we see the second push from the person, and the PID controller bringing the robot beautifully back to the set point. PID control can also be used to make Phoenix move autonomously. Here's an example of when the set point is a position in front of the robot. And here's an example where the set point is an angle, and the output of the system is rotation. Of course, there are much more sophisticated ways to make robots move, which give the designer very specific control over the velocity and the acceleration of the robot at any particular point in time during the movement. These methods are actually employed on Phoenix, and even here, PID plays a very large role in them, but this is an expansive topic for another day. Hopefully by now you have an understanding of what PID theory is, what it's used for, and how it works. Also, I hope you have enjoyed my real-world examples of the application of PID theory.